The scripture lesson for today comes from St. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Hello. I wanted to choose this song because Pastor Bill had mentioned that we can find a lot of Christian messages in the secular songs that we hear. And this was one of the ones that I found after his suggestion to look for that type of thing. And this song reminds me of the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, because it sounds like God singing to us. If you ever find yourself stuck in the middle of the sea I'll sail the world to find you And if you ever find yourself lost in the dark and you can't see I'll be the light to guide you. We find out what we're made of when we are called to help our friends in need. You can count on me like one, two, three, I'll be there. supposed to do to be among you today. It is uh, always good to be out and about. Um, I don't know that um, uh, if you all have uh, had this happen to you, you all are probably young enough that this hasn't uh, happened to you, but I noticed um, uh, for a long time, every time my parents came to visit me, they would um, turn every light in the house on. I didn't know what that was about. And my father would go around, and he's not a particularly handy guy, but he would go around and change all the burnt out light bulbs. I could count on that every time he came. That was his practice. 
And I and I'm and they would I would go to bed and every light in the house would be on and my father would stick a um, uh, a little uh, night lamp in the bathroom so that if he had to get up and go to the bathroom he had a a little lamp in there. And now I'm at the age where I understand why, right? <laughs> now I know. I walk around my house changing all the light bulbs. Where's Dad? Come on, Dad. You need to drive up and in your 80s from North Carolina and take care of this for me. Um, but all of a sudden I understand why. All of a sudden, everything seems a little bit darker. I checked with my eye doctor, and she, she said, yes, you're getting cataracts, like both of my parents had, and uh, that eventually we'll fix those when they're, the time is right. But meanwhile, I need more light on things uh, the older I get. Now my uh, son and my niece who live with me walk around the house going, don't you ever turn lights out? <laughs> I'm like, don't you ever notice when the light bulb burns out? Come on, guys. We have some negotiations left to do. The older I've gotten, the, older, the more I've also noticed that there are many dark places in this world. That there are many places where, as Dickens said, ignorance and want are there, living in the dark. Places where poverty has been allowed to thrive and where children have not been cared for and where pollution is left behind and where there are empty buildings or places where drugs have taken a very strong hold. I was, uh, I, a couple months ago, I read Demon Copperhead. Has anybody read that new Barbara Kingsolver book? It's about our very own Virginia uh, near the Appalachian Mountains and the coming of the uh, pharmaceutical companies who wanted to test their painkillers and did it on a very vulnerable population without a lot of medical care um, and left behind uh, a tremendous Dickens-level um, devastation and darkness. And I wondered, even reading that book, it had glimmers of hope, but where does hope come from when these places are revealed? Um, we, can, we can shine a light on them for a moment, but then the light moves away, and those people are left to pick up the pieces. There is much darkness in the world as I get older, but there is also darkness no matter what our age is. Where does the light come from that needs to shine on this? Well, Jesus gave a very important sermon, and there's a very big question from the scripture as to who he's talking to. In the very beginning, it says he went up, there was a big crowd, but he went up a mountain, and he gathered his disciples, his closest friends, the people that came everywhere with him. But by the end of the sermon, which is quite long, if you read this whole section in Matthew, it goes on for several chapters. Uh, at the end, it says the crowds were amazed that he spoke with such authority. So we kind of think from the story that the crowds came up and followed the disciples to hear what Jesus had to say, which is kind of like who we usually see in church these days, isn't it? We see people who are here every week, and then we see some people who are in and out, and we see some people who are just visiting, and some people who are spiritually curious. That's kind of the people that, are, that Jesus was speaking to, and that's kind of the people that we address in our church world today. So imagine that Jesus is speaking to us as well because he shares some very interesting things to say to this group of people, not all of whom are the insiders in the church, some of whom are just visiting. He says, you are the light of the world. Now we know that Jesus came as the light of the world. The Messiah was to come to be the light to the world to bring justice and mercy and love in ways that no one was going to be able to imagine. The world was going to be changed in an instant with the coming of the Messiah. This is the, the Hebraic tradition that Jesus stands in the middle of. The whole Gospel of Matthew is an argument to the Jewish population that the Messiah has come. And this is where we find Jesus in the sermon, standing right in the middle of that Hebraic tradition that love and justice and mercy have come in a new way with the Messiah. So it is clear that Jesus is the Messiah. It is clear that Jesus is the light like we light the candles here every, every morning when we come together to remind us that this worship service is not about us but about Christ. To remind us that this is not about the things that we may have brought into the room, but it's about seeing the light afresh every week. 
And doing so, Jesus tells us, though, that you are the light. You yourself are the light. Now, he's talking to people who, who some of whom are uh, from the pharisaical tradition and have 613 rules as to how to be a good Jew. Imagine if you wash your hands incorrectly, if you eat dinner with the wrong people, if you eat the wrong food, if you live in ways that do not live up to the 613 ways of being a good and righteous Jew, then you are not considered clean or holy. So he's speaking to people who follow that tradition within the Jewish faith. And he's speaking to the typical fisherman and tax collector and townsperson, farmers, fishermen. He's speaking to everyday people who are not following 613 rules of how to be perfect, how to be clean, how to be uh, perfect in front of God's eyes. But he's saying to all of them, you are the light. That gives me great relief because I'm pretty sure, um, I mean, I know I haven't lived up to 613 Jewish laws, but I'm pretty sure that there's times where in my heart I am not as clean as God would have me be, not as pure as God would have me be. And yet Jesus still says to me and to all of you, you are the light just as you are right now. Before you've done anything, before time, talent, treasure, witness, you are still a light. You are the light. That is a powerful statement to all of us, no matter where we are in our spiritual journey. Beginners, people who are looking at the end zone, people who have wandered off and can't find their way back to the path, you are still the light. And then Jesus follows this up with, let your light shine. That verb to let is an action verb. And he's calling them back to the actions that the Hebraic tradition gave to us in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. So don't let that light, he says, just sit there with a basket over it so that nobody can see. If you're going to put a city on the hill full of light, then you've got to make sure everybody can see it. It's got to be purposeful. It says the light forms and transforms individuals, which is what we talk about a lot, but also entire communities. He is contrasting that outward righteousness of the Pharisees with the inward righteousness that God put as a spark in every single person born on this earth a beautiful spark of God's light, which you already have. He's teaching us about what does it mean to be inclusive of everyone? What does it mean to know that the person that you love the most has a beautiful light of Christ in them? And what does it mean that the person that you hate the most in the world also has a beautiful light of Christ in them? What does it mean to take that light into a world that has so much darkness? You know, we very often think, well, I don't, I don't want to like witness or say something or shine a light, metaphorically speaking, because, you know, I haven't got my act together. And if somebody asked me about it, I don't know that I could talk about it. People come up to me all the time and have questions and they say, you have to tell me because you're a pastor, you studied and went to seminary. And my answer is usually, well, I had lots of questions when I went to seminary and some of them got answered and then I got about 10 times as many more questions. <laughs> God, I have a list for God when I get there. God, all right, we got to talk about some things. <laughs> There's some things I don't understand. There's some places and some ways I do not understand. But we always think we have to get that light polished up so clearly and have all the answers before we let it shine, don't we? We feel like, I don't have a testimony, I don't have a witness to the world because my light's, you know, uh, I haven't 
I have not trimmed that wick very well. I have not taken care of my little light. So I cannot possibly shine it anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's still there. It's still there. And so many people never hear Jesus say to them, you are the light of the world. There is no one listening here today that is not the light of the world. Keith, you're the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Each one of you, that beautiful music brought light into the world today. Those of you watching online, I am clear that there is nothing that can separate us, right? That's what Paul reminds us, that those of you watching online, the light of the world is yours as well. There is nothing in the transmission that can stop the fact that you are the light. And this is where the darkness is allowed to reign. When we let people forget. When we let people assume that there is no light in them. When we let the light stop shining in dark places because it scares us, because it's different, because it's unusual, because it's overwhelmingly painful. I was uh, just talking to a woman who, in a church I served um, whose young son just died in an accident. Um, uh, please keep the Strickler family in your prayers. Um, he was a young firefighter, just, just recruited and died in a training accident. And she wrote me the other day, why did God take my son? Am I a sinful person? And I said, you know better than that. You know that it's not our sins that cover up the light. It's our choice not to let the light shine because of how we feel about who we are. It's our choice not to let others' lights shine and not to acknowledge in them that shiningness because of pain and hurt and fear, because of not understanding that God loves each of us, because God put that spark there. Our denomination is currently struggling through its own dark times. Pandemics, church closings, retirements outnumbering uh, the new pastors by about five to one. Where is the light and hope for the United Methodist Church? Well, I'm here to tell you that there is much light and hope. There is much light and hope. I was at annual conference this year. It was a joy. Yeah, I, it was a real joy to be there. It was a joy there to celebrate. Because, yes, we closed a bunch of churches and we opened new and innovative churches. Do you know that right up here in Northern Virginia, we've opened three churches in the past year and a half? One of them is a food truck on wheels that is going from church to church. You've got to have provision up here. You've got to have a, have a party outside and bring provision. Yeah, you've got a perfect circle for it. Um, provision Church is also doing, it, not, are they, not only are they feeding people and calling them to table ministry, but they are also giving job uh, training to people who um, are hard, have a hard time finding jobs, giving them culinary training to go out with this uh, truck. It's a beautiful mission and church all at the same time. It doesn't meet on a Sunday. It meets on Wednesdays to do the worship and then to plan where they're going to be doing for the weekend. It's a beautiful ministry. And it's innovative and it's totally crazy. And it may not work, but there's a light in a place that we never thought of doing before. Yes, we are slightly smaller and we had this incredible youth delegation at, at uh, annual conference of people who were coming as their schools were still open or closing or, or graduating. We still had youth there that were there to remind us that this is why we do this. So the next generation knows that they have light inside of them and that none of them feel that there's no light in them. So let's look at the bottom line of all of this. You as a Christian, you are the light. You can show it by acts of mercy, joy, and love that let your light shine through. Or you can let it be clouded. You can let it stand alone. 
There's a reason that we say that there's no such thing as Christians who are not part of a community because this was the ultimate calling to be part of a, of a group of people who study however small, you know, wherever two or more are gathered, however small and however large. We can't do this on our own because we alone forget. We alone disconnect. You know, I lost power this week and I went to grab my flashlight. And it's been so long since we lost power that <laughs> the flashlight had no power either. The batteries were dead. It had been left alone in a drawer for a very long period of time. And there was no one to take care of it. So as I pulled it out, I realized the only thing I had was my phone. Anybody else got a phone with a flashlight? You got a phone with a flashlight, pull it out. Let's look at our, let's look at our phones with a flashlight. Here's my flashlight phone. You guys got one? Can we turn the lights out? We, we want to see our flashlights, right? You see it? Those of you at home, if you've got a, a flashlight on your phone, hold it up. So if you've been to a concert in the last 15 years when we've had flashlights, this replaced the candles that people, or the, or the lighters that everybody held up, right? So your flashlight is probably pretty dim, a little bit dim. But look around at the room. Look around at the room. Look at, look at what happens when there are multiple bits of light. And then let's try something else. I don't know how we got it dark enough in here, but let's try this. Call him Joe. I'm going to add up to that. Uh, is it Jesus? Uh, I don't know. Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Tommy, Tommy. Tommy. All right, so here's Tommy. All right, everyone, flat, send your light to Tommy. Tommy doesn't know. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if we get it dark enough, but if you can get it dark enough, if you can get all those flashlight shining down on Tommy, he's going to see it by half, right? He's going to know, right? Yes, he is. He's going to know that there's a path and a place. He's going to know that he's got just as much light as here and as each of you. They forget this. It's simple. So simple that Tommy can get it, but not if nobody tells him. Right? All right, you can turn the lights back on. We only made a trip. Remember, I need the lights on all I can have. <laughs> I'm turning into my dad. Sarah, would you repeat my Oh, I'm sorry. So I said, the little Tommy's down there in the front. And as we all put our lights on him, Tommy may not have remembered or known that he had a light on him. But when all of us turn our light on him, he can see a path. It may just be one person. I can tell you as the mother of a 29-year-old that knows everything, when I tell my son that I'm praying for him or that, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, that's just mom. But when there's a group of people, he's been looking for a job lately, and I told him uh, the other day, my, my whole team is praying for you, Matt. And he's like, everybody? Everybody knows I'm unemployed? Yes, Matthew, everybody knows you're unemployed. And they're all praying for you to get this next job that you want. I've never seen him so touched, and he's not normally touched by that kind of thing. Little Tommy there in the middle may not know from the one person or even the two people that try and remind him time after time that he too is a child of God and that he too is the light. But when the witnesses of many people, when a community is formed around you, in grief or in struggle, in the forgetting and in the remembering of whose child you are. That is when the witness comes together as a community and the more light shines and even the person who cannot see will see. Even the person who cannot feel will know. By the witness and the light we shine. This is why we come together as a church. This is why there will be always hope. And we're going to find it in the local church. And it doesn't stay here focused inside on the carpet right there. We've got to take it out. We've got to join up with each other. We've got to join up with places and people that you all are already doing beautiful work with. Look at how much you've collected to take care of hungry people. Look at the work you've done in your very own bulletin just today. This is what it looks like
to do some of this work. But attached to all of those canned goods, all of that money raised, are people. Canned goods do not know if you have shined a light on them. Money doesn't know that you've shined a light on it. It's helpful. It helps us do the work. But people do. And so the call that we have is to be a witness with our light to hope. Not because we're perfect at it. Not because we ourselves don't forget, and we do. But those of you who are here today and watching us online today, those of you who have done that, you've come to say, I want to brush it off. I want to clean it up. I want to remind myself that there is light inside of me, however imperfect I feel it may be. And I can take it into the world with mercy and justice and love and multiply the work that Jesus started on that Sermon on the Mount where he looked at that huge crowd of people, some of them the people who were most faithful to him and some of them who had never met him before and said, you are the light. Let us pray. Holy and wondrous Lord, shake off anything inside of us that gets in the way of us shining that light. Lord, help us to be a beacon. Help us to light our own candles strongly and remind ourselves of our beauty as your light and to come together as a community, to look into the dark places that may be scary, to welcome the people that have forgotten to go out to the places where uh, darkness has been allowed to stay and to say that we are the light and you are the light to everyone that we meet. We do this in your name, through your encouragement and your love that is already ours. And we pray in your holiest of names. Amen. <laughs>
Thanks for joining us. If you're interested in visiting us in person, we are at the corner of Liberty Meeting Court and Sugarland Road. Look forward to seeing you soon.